I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, and now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then this great sentence, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, When I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he concludes this wonderful passage with a little surprise at the end that reminds us of the impact that Paul's faithfulness to proclaim the gospel had, even in Caesar's household. He says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. So there were many Christians who came to faith, even close to the emperor. And then he adds, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So this is the the last in the series for... I think it's 12 or 13 weeks we've been at Philippians. And what's the basic overarching thing of Philippians? I heard it. Good. Joy. So at least somebody uh, caught that. That's good. Yes, we've talked a lot about joy. We've talked about it from different, we talked about joy and suffering. We talked about sharing joy and being on the same team and spreading the gospel. All different aspects of joy. But one of the things that I was thinking, and I was kind of having fun, I was trying to think, what should I title this last uh, sermon here. I, I titled it uh, Content and Rejoicing, but some earlier versions I went through as I said, well, we're ending up the series, so how about Philippians? No more joy. No? <laughs> how about uh, the end of all joy is on the horizon? No? How about when I'm done preaching today, your heart will be filled with joy? Yeah? No. <laughs> all right, so we went with Content in Rejoicing. So one of the things that as I was we were looking at these different facets and the different aspects of joy, and he said they all kind of come together. And a facet is a word that's oftentimes used of a, of a jewel, that it's, it's one jewel, but when you look at it from different ways, you see different lights, different aspects of that. And so we've been coming at joy from different directions. So today we're going to consider the concept of what's the secret to contentment? What's the secret to contentment? Now, I would think when we're talking about contentment that we'd say that most people want to be content. Would you agree? Most people want to be content. And they say, I'd like to be content. I'd like to, to, to be okay with where I'm at. I'd like to have things going well. And I'd say that contentment, it, it seems to me anyways, that contentment is one of these things that it's, it's easier to do when things are going well. And it's harder to do when things aren't going well. It's harder to be content when things aren't going your way. It's harder to be on a a, a basketball team that's losing by 50 points every single game. It's harder to be content with that. 
It's hard, and it's easier to be content if you're on the championship basketball team or whatever's going on in your life or whatever, that it's easier to be content when things are going right. But you know what? I think there's a lot more to this, and we're going to look a little bit more at what we mean by contentment here. I mean, one of the things that we, we think about is we think about who's talking about this. Well, Paul is talking about contentment. And if you had somebody whose life story was kind of the poster boy of all things going wrong, he was it. It isn't here, it's somewhere else. He lists all the things he's gone through. He's been flogged, beaten, he's been wrongly accused, he's been shipwrecked, he's been hungry, he's been thirsty, he's been uh, uh, stoned, all these different things he's listed. And that's not even what's going on to him right now. When he's writing this letter to the Philippians, he's writing from where? He's writing from prison. He's in prison or in a, a state, a kind of like a house arrest sort of thing. And so he basically doesn't have any freedom. He's basically uh, has a guard all the time around him. He's not free to go anywhere at the time. He, it's not a nice situation. He wants to be going elsewhere. He's been, uh, he's there to, to possibly, he's going to be on trial. Who knows when? It could be forever. And so all these things that obviously we've seen in prior weeks, the Philippians are very concerned about, and they're all anxious about this. But you know, the thing I think that's interesting about Paul is that Paul doesn't come across. How does he come across when he writes? Does he come across somebody who's dejected? No, I wouldn't say so. Is he, does he seem demoralized? Does he, he seem anxious? No, in fact, as he writes, you almost have to kind of know what's going on to him because the, the tenor, the tone of what he's going through as he says what he's talking about almost doesn't fit with what we know about the situation that he's in. And to us, that's a great example. So one of the things that we have to think about is, is that make it, maybe contentment's a little more complex than we really had thought about. Because here you have Paul, and he's kind of unfazed or not concerned about what's going on to him. It doesn't mean he's not paying attention, but he's just not concerned. And so he's writing this thank you note. And we're not going to get into a lot of the thanks, and there's a lot of other things we could talk about that with the Philippians. But the Philippians have basically provided him with a gift, which is probably really helpful. To add insult to injury, when you're in a state of house arrest back then, you had to pay for it. So you're, it's kind of like going to jail and then having to pay for being there. So they sent him some uh, funds to be able to help him with that. And he thanks them. And he says, he says, you know, I wasn't really looking for anything, but thank you. And I look for, and I thank you more because I'm glad for what God has credited for your sakes to your account. So what's Paul's secret to contentment? What's his secret to contentment? And more importantly, I'd say, how can I get it? How can we get that sort of contentment. Because if he can be content in those circumstances, we could be content in a lot. So what is contentment when we think about it? What is it? Well, a couple things that I think we should think about what contentment is not. Being content with a situation is not somehow being emotionally detached from the situation. Some people are more naturally emotionally de detached from things, but they're not talking about that. That's not what he's talking about, contentment. He's also not talking about contentment in the sense that you're, you know, you've heard people say, oh, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm all set with where I'm at. I'm content with, he's not trying to say uh, that we should be content with our lives in the sense that we're okay to be spiritual dwarfs or that we're not supposed to grow or not supposed to spend, you know, the Bible's very clear about this. You are not supposed to be, you know, getting milk for the rest of your life. You're supposed to get the meat of the gospel. So when we talk about personal advancement or, or, or spiritual development, we aren't to be content. In fact, there's something that the Bible, it doesn't use these words, but there's, a, there's like a, maybe a holy discontent with where we're at. We always want to grow. We always want to become more. So what exactly is this contentment that he's talking about? Well, I think when he's talking about content, he's talking about being content in our spirit in circumstances. Now, we may have needs, or everybody here has different things going on in your lives. Maybe there's something like what I was praying about before. Maybe you've got a child who's, who's gone into all sorts of interesting things. Maybe you've got a parent that never loved you. 
Uh, maybe you've got a situation where your, your, your parents are arguing or that you're arguing with your spouse. Or maybe you have a situation where you have a, a very irate neighbor and it's, you think you're doing everything that you can. You're trying to pray for them and love them and there's nothing that can do. What is, whatever the situation, maybe there's something, you have some sort of legal proceeding that either you're undertaking or somebody has against you. Maybe you have an ailment, something that you've not been able to get rid of and something that just keeps you from being able to have your heart filled with joy. But we look at Paul and we say, he's content to be in his circumstances. I'm reminded of that kind of that old saying that somebody says, uh, he says, well, how are you doing? He says, well, I guess I'm okay considering the circumstances. And the guy says, well, what are you doing under your circumstances? I said that wrong, but I'm okay under the circumstances. What are you doing under there? What are you doing under the circumstances? And I think there's more profound truth to that one. I almost named the sermon that. There's, there's uh, profound truth in that. It's saying, what, what has that got to do with anything? Your circumstances. Certainly you have to deal with them. But what are you doing under your circumstances? Why are you letting those dictate your joy? Why are you letting those dictate your life? Certainly you have to address them. Certainly you have to be praying for them. The Bible depicts us as doing those, as praying for those situations, giving them over to God, but it does not depict us as worrying about them, it does not show us as being concerned about them in such a way that affects our heart or our joy. Now another thing that's kind of interesting is in verse 11, I'll pop it back up there. I'll have to pop back a few. Oh, I went the wrong way. I always do that. Um, down goes down, yes, up is up. Okay, 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Well, we love that verse. That's a great verse. We focus on the content, and we miss the learned, I think. And I think that's an important aspect, that Paul is saying that I have learned that in whatever situation I am to be content. You know, there's many times we look at things in life and we say, you know, I can see God's hand working through that, right? You've ever had that sort of situation where, yeah, that wasn't exactly the way you had it planned. I think poor Joseph, when he was dragged into Egypt, it wasn't exactly what he had planned. But at the end of that, he had a perspective that his brothers didn't have. He had a perspective that's very hard. They didn't say it right there, but, you know, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God meant it. While you meant it, God also meant it. And he was weaving that through there. And that he learned that at the end. We learn things through tough times. We learn through things through adversity. We also learn them through good times, too. But when we learn those things, I, I, you've probably had somebody who's talking about it. He says, oh, yeah, you know what? Years and years ago, we had this trouble in our marriage, and we learned how to get it together, and we pulled together, and now we're closer than we have. Or somebody said, you know what? When I was back in the military, I learned this. Or back when I was a kid and I was in this situation, I learned this situation, and now I'm better off for it. Well, interestingly enough, I don't think that's entirely what Paul is talking about. I think that's in there, but I think... Those sorts of situations, the person saying, hey, looked back at something and said, now I'm much better. I think Paul is not so much looking back as he's looking through. Does that make sense? That he's not looking back and saying, I learned all these things. I think he's also saying, I have learned these things because I am continuing to learn them. I have learned this nugget of truth, but I continue to learn it through everything that God teaches me. I have learned how to get through this situation. That Paul is not just looking back, but he's looking through and he's kind of reoriented how he looks at things. So Paul has reoriented his contentment away from a worldview of, of, of what the world looks at and what the world would give him and, and to a worldview where he's just content with what Christ gives him, what Christ alone gives to him. And that Paul isn't just looking, a lot of times when we talk about contentment, we talk about trying to get to a point where we can, we can survive those tough times to a point where we can now be in safety or in plenty or in abundance or whatever. And I don't think that. I think, I think that Paul's talking more about, rather than just about surviving to contentment, he's saying about thriving in contentment with what I have, with where God has put me right now. The other thing that's intriguing in there, that if you, you missed it, you can think about this a little. What does he really say? We miss this too, I think, a lot. He says, 
I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. Or in some versions, as I, I know what it means to be in need and in want uh, and how to, do, uh, uh, how to live in plenty. And it says, in any, any circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. What's often missed in there, I think, as I think we think about hunger and need? He says, I've learned to be able to survive. I've been able to thrive in times of plenty. I've been able to sur survive in times of abundance. And if there's something that we as the American church miss so much of the time is the fact that our abundance really inhibits our ability to be able to lean on God more fully. There's many times that in our excess, in what we have, in our blessing, in what we compare ourselves to people around us who have much more, that we look at and we say, well, I don't have enough, or I don't have what I need, or I don't have all these things. And that's so different than how the Bible looks at things. So I love the fact that he says, look, I've figured out how to thrive in the middle of plenty because, you know, that's tough. I've, I've figured out how to survive and thrive in times of abundance because that's tough. As well as the need. As well as the tougher times. So I wanted to bring out a few ideas of, of how we can rejoice in the Lord. How can we rejoice in the Lord? Well, I, have, I wrote down four things. There's more than four things, but four that I wanted to focus on. I'd like to say we can rejoice in the Lord by focusing on what we do have. That's one way. Focus on what we do have because it's so easy for us to look at what others around us have and to forget about what we have. To look at what others' even super abundance is and forget what we have in abundance. And I am also talking about the fact that we have in great abundance the one thing that somebody who's not a Christian has zero of, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And that is so far beyond anything of the world that you see the Bible over and over saying, what good is it if you gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? What you have in eternity, what you have in Christ is so far beyond anything that you could have in this temporal world that we have to be just in awe of what God has given us in that gift. So the first thing that we do out of the four is to focus on what we already have. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a gift. It's given to us. And the second thing which kind of leads out of that, I kind of hit it, is to focus on the eternal rather than the temporal. In other words, rather than the, of what's happening right now, um, don't get me wrong, I think it is good for us to be present in wherever we're at. But rather than focusing on what we do or don't have at this time, focus on what we have for all eternity. And that's what you hear about people who are martyrs or who people who give up all they have and are happy at the end of it or joyful at the end of it is because they realize that what they've given up is not something they could have kept. But what they have given it for is something they will have for forever. So we focus on the eternal and not the temporal. And the third thing that I wanted to, the, so we reorient, like Paul did, we reorient what we need versus what we want. What we need versus what we want. So many times we, we slip into this word of, I need this pair of pants, or I need to have a new car, I need to have these things, when we really are really talking more about want. We're really talking more about what we would desire. Now, it's not wrong to desire things. I'm not saying that. It's how we handle that desire that's really the problem. But reorient that a little bit and also bring in the aspect of what it is that God thinks we need. Because there's sometimes when what we need is exactly the thing that we don't want. I don't know if you've experienced that in your life. I know that I have. And the fourth thing that we need to do is that to think about the fact that God may want us exactly where we are. And we see that in Paul. It says, Paul it has this sense that, look, I'm where God wants me to be. If they opened up the, and, and freed him the next day, he would have left. He wasn't there because he was choosing to be there, but he realized that he was there and that God would use him. And he would spend those times trying to say, okay, I'm here, what can I do here? Rather than being focused 
on what it is they do or do want, don't want of that situation to say, what can God do? How can he bless others through me here? And that reorienting things around God's will and say, why does God have me here? What is it that I need to learn out of this situation? I kid about it. I'm, <laughs> I'm very serious, though. I, a lot of times I pray the thing. I'm like, Lord, teach, it what, teach me whatever it is you're trying to teach me through this so I don't have to go through it again. <laughs> I want to learn from this situation. Teach it to me because obviously you're trying to teach me something through this adversity and through this difficult time. So the four things are focus on what we have, focus on the eternal rather than the temporal, to reorient want versus need. And the fourth one is that God, knowing that God wants you where you are. And I don't mean from a spiritual dwarf point of view. Yes, he wants you to keep growing, but he wants you placed where you are because that may be exactly how you will grow or how you will reach out or how you will touch or care for somebody or help somebody else. So I wanted to talk also a word about this word content. Uh, content is an interesting word because uh, the way that it's used uh, in the Greek language of the time is it, it oftentimes is re referred to a content country. And what it means by content country is a country that has everything that it needs. It's self-sufficient. It doesn't need in import, export. It doesn't need those sorts of things to survive. Uh, it, it doesn't have to have neighbors to be able to do these things. It's self-sufficient in of itself. Now, Paul uses this word. He uses it in a little different fashion, but I think it's helpful for us to understand that uh, like the self-sufficient meaning that it doesn't need that help from the outside, that it's not affected. Paul incorporates God's provision in that. He's saying, look, I don't need the things of the world to prop up my joy. I don't need, and in fact, the things of the world have very little to do with my joy. They don't affect it one way or the other. You could, he kind of gives that sense of the fact. He says, hey, thanks for your gift, but you know what? Hey, you know, I would have been fine without it. But I'm glad that God gave it to you. You're talking about a guy who's in prison who needs the money. And he's like, God will provide, you know. But I'm glad that you gave to me. Thank you for doing that and so forth. And there's kind of a strangeness of the fact that he wants to thank them at the same time as he doesn't feel like he needs to thank them because he knows that it's just God's hand in the whole process. The other thing I wanted to focus on is these words, all things. And I actually picked the ESV. The old NIV of the 1984 version has it. But the, the, the word, I can do all things. In some of the versions it has, I can do all this. And that's actually them trying to say, and they're trying to fight against the fact that some people misuse this this one. They misapply this verse. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So I'm going to go fly. No. I can't do all things. It's not talking about all things. It's, not, it's talking about something very specific here. But I do like the fact that it says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In talking about all things in the will of God. And that he can do all things who him who strength, through him who strengthens him. And when he's talking about strengthening him, he's talking about doing all things through him who empowers me, who enables me, who undergirds, who's the source of my power, Jesus Christ. I'm able to do all things. So I'm not anxious in the context. I'm not worried about what it is. I'm not worried of whether or not I'll be able to make it through. I'm not letting that affect my joy because I know that I am in the center of the Lord. And if the Lord takes me, then that's what the Lord wants. And I'm okay with that because I trust in the Lord. If the Lord keeps me in prison for the next five years, then I'm okay with that because that's what the Lord wants wanted. He doesn't let the world affect his joy. And Jesus Christ gives him the power to endure any and all circumstances in plenty or in want. He gives him the power to endure, the power to thrive in his, certain, in his circumstances, and the power, most importantly, to rejoice in God for where he's at and what he has. So here's a question. In our life, are we rejoicing? Are we rejoicing? Are we struggling? Or are we content in rejoicing despite our circumstances like Paul was? That Paul was okay with the circumstances. He didn't, didn't prefer them, but he was okay with it because he said, this is where God wants me and I will rejoice nevertheless. It was just last week we talked about that. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Rejoice no matter what situation you're going. So can we say this honestly? Can we say it in part? 
can we say it fully? That we are rejoicing in our circumstances, even when they're bad, even when they're not the way we want, even sometimes when they're abundant. Are we rejoicing in the Lord? What circumstances are there around you? And maybe some of the things I listed before, there may be other things. There may be things that you're not even totally aware that are happening yet, but there's something that is just pulling at your soul. You haven't identified what it is in your life. Maybe you've been drifting farther away from the Lord. Maybe you haven't been turning things over to him. Maybe you haven't been seeking him in prayer on your knees. Well, whatever those circumstances are around you, whatever, if there's people who are knocking down your door, if there's people who are, who are at your throat and trying to take your life or trying to take your family or trying to take these things, those are your circumstances. Well, what I would say is that when it relates to joy, don't look around you. Look up. Don't look around you. Look up. Look up to the Lord. Another way to kind of think of this is that if the world raises problems, raise your head. If the world raises problems for you, raise your head. You can talk to God. You can even complain to God. I'd like to talk about that. Sometime we'll go through lamentations. And like, you can complain to God. You can tell him your heart because he already knows it. He already knows what's going on in your heart long before. If you pray, I think it was just this morning that uh, uh, David Ash in his class, we were talking about in his uh, uh, thing, they talked about God. If we come to... Uh, Somebody in some religions, they say you have to come and pray and, and confess to somebody. Well, for them, it's news to them. For God, it's never news to him. It's never new. He already knows what's going on in your heart. Come to God, and, and you, can, you can even complain or even do that. But the question is, where does that take you? If you ever wonder where that takes you, try and find a psalm. I can only think of one or two that end on a sour note. You'll find a lot of psalms that talk about unhappiness with their circumstances, that their enemies are pursuing them, but they always end up with this, but I will rejoice nevertheless, or I will seek the Lord, or I will trust in the Lord because he is mighty and he is forever. So if the world raises problems, raise your head. So what's Paul's secret? Paul's secret, what has he found? He found this secret. All that he's going through, and he's found this secret, and we can find it too. Paul's secret to contentment in all circumstances is to be content with the contents of light. I like that word. It's both content and content in the same word. But be content with the contents of life, of what life gives you. Be content in the midst of that. That doesn't mean you have to always be happy about it, but always be joyful in the midst of it. Now, this is not meant to be an idealistic or a fanciful view of contentment, but a real one of how we can live out our life being content with what we have. So just to kind of wrap this up, I'd like us to imagine for a second. I'm actually, actually going to do something. You may think it's a little campy. I'm going to ask everybody to close their eyes for just a second and imagine what it would be like to go through every single day of your life being content that you would say every single day, you can rejoice. You wake up, you say, I rejoice in the Lord. You go to sleep at night, I rejoice in the Lord. You may be there already, but I will tell you that not everybody is there, myself included. There's many times that I get all caught up with the goods or the bads or the uglies of the world, the goods, the bads, the uglies of my friends, my family, myself, and I allow discontent to seep into my heart when I need to be rejoicing? What would it be like to live each day knowing that you can rejoice no matter what it is? We can have that. Not through some sort of self-help guru, not sort of something that we can do, we can pull, up our, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and just think positive. Yes, we want to think positive, but we think positive because we know about God and we know that God loves us and that God loves us so greatly that he will take care of us and we can be content. Okay, you can open your eyes here. <laughs> you don't have to keep them closed. I opened my eyes a little early there. Uh, so, but if you've imagined that, then at least you know what is possible because the Bible tells us it's possible because we see Paul is content in his time. He's content with the contents of his life. He's content with where God has put him. 
So do not give up on that, brothers and sisters. Do not give up on that dream or that imagining that you just had because that can be had. The Bible tells us to rejoice, whether it be in plenty or in want. Whether we have abundance or we're in need, we can rejoice and that we be, can be cont content in rejoicing because of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for what you've made us, your children, that you have brought us to the mercy seat. And we are forgiven, not because of what we do, but because of what Christ did. There's nothing we can do to be able to, to pull ourselves, to wrestle ourselves, to, to lose what we have in Jesus Christ because it wasn't up to us in the first place. It was all about Jesus. Help our lives to be all about Jesus, to focus on him, and to help others to do the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.